everyone. Welcome. Hi, my name's Rebecca. I'm from the BizCrowd stand over there, and welcome to the BizCrowd Fiesta. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce you to James Finlayson. He is the head of search at Pure Blue, and he'll be talking to you today about using data to create brand, brand advocacy. So, welcome, James. Take the floor. Thank you. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Okay, so um, as Becky said, I'm James Finlayson. I'm head of search at Pure Blue. We're an e-commerce agency specializing in Magento. We're based down in Pimlico. Um, so this year, I've more and more been thinking about a fundamental problem, which is that it's becoming harder and harder to get links online. It's becoming harder and harder to rank because Google's changing the algorithm, more people are, com are competing. When that happens, it suddenly becomes easier to be looking at the end of your funnel. Why are people coming back to buy a second time? Why are people becoming loyal? Why are they suggesting people buy from you? Because if it's becoming more difficult to acquire new customers, then we should be spending progressively more time on making sure that our existing customers are spending more and telling people about the brand, making sure that loyalty is a bigger and bigger part of what we do. I've been looking into exactly why people do that. And part of the obvious answer is that everyone wants to feel like a VIP. Everyone wants a bespoke service, like you get from a small boutique shop in the real world. This is searches in Google over time for personalized gifts. It's massive at the moment. And it, this is really an area that the offline world's really, really beating us at. If you look at Starbucks, you've got the name on the cup now. They make sure that they make you feel like an individual despite being a multinational company. Coke's doing the same thing. It's had a massively successful campaign with names on, on the coat. Suddenly I'm going out and I'm trying to find a coat with my name on it. Same product. They've individualized it and suddenly I want to buy it. And this is something that's not new. It's something that offline, well tailors have been doing it forever. You spend more going to a more expensive tailor, partially because of the cuts, but mostly because of the amazing service you're going to get. You're really going to feel like they're treating you as an individual. So for all the technology we have online and everything we're doing online, most websites Ooh, something's gone a bit wrong with the font, but most websites are still like catalogs. You pick it up and everything in that catalog is standard. Everything is created for the widest audience they could possibly come up with because then they think there's more chance of more people buying. And that really doesn't enthrall people. That doesn't get people to love and trust you as a brand if you're trying to hit the widest area possible. But there's the problem. This is why catalogs do it is because if you don't go for the widest area possible you're cutting certain customers off but with the technology we have online now we can start personalizing websites I mean if you want to see the value of personalization online you just have to look at social networks what you what you're spending time with Facebook and Twitter etc doing is getting that personalized feel you go there to find out what your friends been up to not to find out what Facebook thinks you need to know heck We've been doing it for emails forever. Skip's been telling you about everything that's been done to make sure emails are consistently personalized. And by personalizing those emails, it's pretty much guaranteed that you get a higher conversion rate. You get a higher click-through, you get more people buying because they feel that you're advertising to them specifically. So why don't we do it with websites? Why is it that when I go on a website and you go on the website, we get exactly the same experience? Well, my big bet for 2014 is that personalization is going to be absolutely massive. There was a, a study done by e-consultancy back in August that had 61% saying personalization is critical to success in the future. So what does personalization on the website look like? Well, once someone registers on your website, you have all sorts of information. You know their name, and from that you can usually derive their sex if they don't give you that. You know their location from their IP address. You've got a whole heap of information about buying habits stored in the back end of Magento or whatever CMS you use to store the details about why your what your customers are buying and who they are. So you can start using that in some clever ways. This is an example. Take shoe, for example. They sell pretty much every shoe you could possibly want to buy. But if I consistently go on there and buy running shoes, it makes sense for the big banner where you're showing the main offer to be showing running shoes. If you show me trainers and you know I never buy trainers, that's a massively missed opportunity. 
But at the moment, most websites just have them going around in circles. You set four or five and everyone sees the same. If you know that I only ever buy running shoes, only show me running shoes. Equally, imagine on a product page. You've got a few celebrities supporting you and that's fantastic and you show people who use your product. If you're showing a really beefy guy using your product and you know that the person returning is a woman, that's not going to make them feel that the brand's totally for them. It would be a lot better if you used your female celebrity on that page to show them that the product fits with them so they can connect with it better. Simple changes on the website to fit in with buying habits really make people feel that the brand is for them that the brand connects with their values and meets with what they're interested in. That increases conversion rate and increases the brand advocacy we talked about. Now, changing those things in the back end, technical changes here and there, if you're not technical minded, you're looking for a, a basically plug and play solution, there are paid solutions. So monetize and maximize are all offer options where you just click, drag and say, this group that always spends over 100 pounds, that comes on the website more than twice a week. We want to make sure that they have this special offer that they see. We want to push the higher products to the top. They offer those solutions. They're not cheap solutions, but if you're looking for a plug and play solution, they fit just that. So you've started personalizing your website. You've started meeting and making sure that it meets what the customer's actually wanting to buy and meets who they are as a person. The next thing you've got to do is provide good old customer service. Because again, going back to the catalog analogy, so many websites exist and they're on there and I can browse through them, but if I want to speak to a human being, that's pretty much impossible. If I want to get some sort of real reaction from someone to check on an order, it's difficult. Let's use the going shopping analogy. So I go shopping and everyone's done this and you go into a big, say, a big supermarket you can't find what you want. You search everywhere and it's not there. The natural reaction is to find a shopping assistant in real life. You find a shopping assistant and how you feel about that brand will mostly depend on how the conversation then goes with that shopping assistant. If that shopping assistant can find what you want, can help you, maybe offer an alternative, you won't care that it was out of stock or that you couldn't find it originally. Equally, if that shopping assistant tells you to get stuff, isn't helpful, tells you they're too busy, negative reaction to that brand. That shopping assistant is key, but they don't exist online, right? Most websites, you go there, you can't find anything, you get a 404 page. What does the 404 page say? Typically, it says, go home, go back to the front of the website, look there again. Maybe use the search box in the left-hand corner. Could you imagine if a shop assistant in real life told you to go to the front of the store and start looking again? you'd walk out. So why do we accept that behavior online? Brands shouldn't be doing it. Here's an example of something I've been experimenting with recently. So lots of websites already use live chat. They already have a box that pops up saying, any questions, ask us and we'll fill this in. Put it in the center of the page on the 404 page. So if people can't find what they're looking for, don't tell them to just go look again. Tell them to ask have that conversation with them. You turn what up to then is a relatively negative experience into a massively positive one. If the page genuinely doesn't exist, telling them to go around in circles again is just going to antagonize them. If you've got this on there, then you can suggest alternative products. You can help that relationship grow. Almost no one's doing this now, which means that if you start doing it, you get a lead over your competitors, you become the friendly brand where you can actually speak to a real person, not just with the live chat on the left-hand corner on most pages, but you incentivize it on the 404 page. You tell people when they're stuck, when they don't know what to do, tell us, we'll see what we can do. Try it out. None of this works though if you don't have the right data. So we talked about segmenting the audience, we've talked about trying to work out what they're interested in and placating them on an individual basis. But most of the time as marketers, the data we have is pretty poor actually. The default Google Analytics setup that everyone relies on doesn't tell you half the pieces of information you need to know about the customer to make these intelligent decisions. 
Now, if you're running a heavyweight shopping uh, system like Magento, a load of the information in your Magento will be able to give you that, that lead to say, okay, this is this type of audience, I can segment them out from there. But if you're not, you're relying on analytics. Let's connect the dots. So last month, Google launched demographic reports. We've been using them massively since they've launched because they give you so much data about the user. So now, if you set it up in analytics, you can get access to age. So you know the standard age of your audience. You can mix this up with whether they actually convert. So if you know 40 and 50 year olds are the highest converting group, what can you do to increase that? If you know that 19 year olds are never ever buying, make a buying decision then as to whether they should be targeted at all or whether you need to do something about the website because you know it's not performing for that age group. You can do the same thing with sex. Now this is particularly interesting when you've got a product that you just assume is meant for men or women. Have a look in and you'll find, you often find that there's a surprisingly large proportion of the other sex buying it as well. You've got to then think about the buying signals that you have on that page. Could that percentage be a lot higher if you weren't accidentally excluding them by the way you talk about the product? Because you've always assumed that the primary audience is one rather than the other. You can also segment by affinity. So what do these guys do in their spare time? Google tells you that information now. So you can work out, okay, if I've got a blog, 90% of people coming to my website really care about sports. Maybe I should put some sports analogies in here somewhere. Maybe I should start talking about sports in a way that's related to my product. Same sort of thing with interest. Interest gets you a little bit more detail there, gets you the ability to really drill down. As of last night, you now have sales intent, which is really, really interesting. Because what you're able to do is say, okay, this person's come to my website, but before they were coming to my website, maybe the last 50 websites they were looking at were all about buying a new car. So you can see that what they're actually trying to buy maybe is different from what you serve. That might mean that the way people are finding their way to your website doesn't quite make sense. This gives you a real idea as to what they're actually looking to purchase. We haven't tested this last one as much because literally it launched, well, four days ago in the US, last night here. So go into that data and have a look at it. We've, we're giving away a free dashboard. So if you go to this website address, and I will tweet a link to the presentation later, you can click that link, it will take you into Google Analytics, and it will give you a complete page with your entire audience segmented and broken down by age, sex, conversion rate, everything you need to really understand what parts of your audience are buying, what parts aren't. So how do you get this set up? Because by default, Google Analytics doesn't do it. Well, Google says for you to go and change the green line to the red line. That's the official policy. Seriously, don't do that. Like, if you do that, you will get fired. If you're working for yourself, fire yourself. Seriously. I'll tell you why. According to a recent survey, 22% of people now use ad blockers. If you use this code, it's the same code that Google uses to serve ads. So if you put that code on your website as Google tells you, you'll lose 22% of your traffic overnight. Now, technically the visitors will still be on the website, but as far as Google's an analytics is confirmed, they won't exist. You won't be able to see them, you won't be able to see where they go, what they're up to, what they're buying. That audience will disappear because the Google Analytics code will suddenly get blocked by every single ad blocker out there. So don't do it as Google says. Basically use this code. There's a code behind that link which checks to see whether an ad block is installed. If an ad block is installed, it uses the old Google Analytics code that you'll be using currently. If that code isn't installed, it uses the new one that gives you that demographic information. That way you get the best of both. You still get the demographic information on most people, on 70 odd percent of your audience, but for the 22 percent who have ad blocker installed, you can still at least see how they're making their way around the website. You don't lose visitors overnight because of it. Another area that people really, really aren't spending enough time looking at is unhappy customers. So everyone looks at the traditional funnel. Everyone looks at how many people come to their website, how many people end up on the checkout page, 
and how many people buy. But remember, if we're trying to build brand advocates, we have to think further than that. What happens afterwards? What's your return rate? What part of the audience, because we're now segmenting, return the product and why? By default, Google Analytics doesn't really give you any sort of way to do that. You can't say that everyone that lands on this page buys the product but then returns it. By default, you can't do that. What you need to set up is something called a reverse transaction. If you set this up, and there's a guide just behind that link, you can then see in analytics a segment from who then returns the product. So you can see that, okay, it's 30-year-old men that return the product. It's people that come through this particular affiliate that I've got running who return the product. Because returning the product is costing you more than the product and the postage. It's costing you that customer potentially for life. Maybe you just need to explain the product differently to them. If they land on a page which just is never going to give them the right sort of information, make sure that there's a step that properly explains what the product or service is to them because then you can make sure that they are qualified before they buy. Frankly, you'd much rather have 100% of your customers happy with basically no return rate than a decent chunk of return rate, because then you've got an audience of brand advocates rather than people saying, I tried that, you shouldn't, didn't work for me. Make sure that they're qualified. Get uh, return rate tracking in place, because then you're able to do that. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is finding VIPs. So it starts with a story. There's this website called Cycle, uh, Cycle Love Road. And they sell t-shirts mainly. So this guy created this website and he got his first ever order. He was ecstatic. You know, it's that first order, it's exactly what he's been waiting for. And he made a promise to himself. Okay, my first order, I will deliver it by hand. I don't care how far it is, I'll deliver it by hand. Didn't work out well for him. He was based in London. The first order came from Peterborough. But no, he's going to cycle to Peterborough and deliver it. So he set off at 4 o'clock in the morning. And by 5, he was going over London Bridge. And he spent basically the whole day traveling to Peterborough to deliver it, uh, the T-shirt. He lost bags of money doing this, right? But look how happy the customer is, right? He cycled 105 miles. It took him nearly 12 hours. But that guy's going to tell his friends about the T-shirt that got delivered, right? That's a brand advocate immediately. His first ever customer is a brand advocate. And that's awesome. But you're probably thinking exactly the same thing I thought when I first saw this. Yeah, that doesn't scale. I'm not employing an army of bicyclists to go across the country to deliver T-shirts just to make people happy. Well, the answer is it doesn't have to. You don't have to make every single customer into a brand advocate. Because not every single customer, if we're being straight, is going to be as useful to you as others. Some people are useful. Some people have massive influence that if you can get them to just mention you, they give you an audience of a million people, they give you an audience of a thousand people. We're not just talking about celebrities here. Bloggers, frankly, people with just a high social uh, tra social traction, have that ability to really push you in front of their audience and really make secondary and tertiary sales off of that. Some people, less so. Well, the question is how you do you break them up? How do you know at scale that this is an important person who I can really make a difference to, who can, if I turn them into a brand advocate, it's really worth the investment, versus someone who, okay, they're a customer, I want to make them happy, but it's not worth putting in the, the extra effort. Well, there are three services that do just this. Fliptop, Full Contact, Rapleaf. Um, we use Full Contact the most, pretty much because it's been out the longest and it's got a great API. What this does, you supply the services with the email addresses of your customers. It gives you every detail it can find about their social uh, metrics. Now, it won't find this for everyone. It'll find it for maybe 60% of the audience. But what it will tell you is how many followers they have on Twitter, what their clout score is if you care about clout, how many people on Facebook are following them, 
it gives you all those sort of metrics to work out if this person's actually really important. So you can then say, okay, I own, I'm only going to put in the extra mile. I'm going to do that extra step for people who have more than 5,000 people following them on Twitter, who have an audience in total bigger than 50,000. Because I know if I do that, they might mention the products on their social metrics, they might blog about me, and then I've got something going there. So use those tools to give you the data. Now, there's two ways generically to use these tools. The easy option is this Google spreadsheet. You sign up with the tools, you stick in your API key, you copy in any email address, you copy in 100 email addresses, you copy in 10,000 email addresses, and it will give you those details. It'll start churning through and out pops the social credentials. It's good, it's cheap, well, it's free, um, and it's easy. It's not the best solution because it's manual. Right? Effectively, you are copying details in there. You might want to do it once a week, you might want to do it once a month to see have any people that can really make a difference started to sign up. The best option takes a bit of coding. So behind this link, what you'll find is some code. Um, you'll need to customize it and frankly, get a dev team in involved if you're not comfortable with that. But what it will do is as soon as someone's ordered something from your website, it'll take that name, it'll chuck it at full contact. All of this happens automatically in the background. It then gets their social details. If it matches certain criteria that you set in the code, then it emails you to tell you this person has just registered. Then you can go on Facebook, you can go on Twitter, and you can start interacting with them. Thank them for registering. What you can also do with this code is you can kick off other actions. So if you have a real life device that's internet connected, say you've got an Arduino or something like that, you could get a light to start flashing if a celebrity starts buying something from you. By putting in bits like that, you don't have to even think about it. You just get an email telling you, okay, this guy's kind of a big deal and they've just uh, bought something from you. You should probably think about chucking in some extra product. Maybe you can think about you know, checking with them that, they did a, that they're happy. Maybe give them a call and really babysit that order the way through so that they don't end up saying negative, something negative because your team in the factory forgot about that order. Instead, they're saying something massively positive because you've really made sure they've had an amazingly good experience. Set that up to really happen basically as soon as someone registers. But please, take your existing customer list and run that through it. So if you've got 3,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people that bought from you already, you're sitting on a gold mine, okay? Because that list already has people who potentially can be so good for you as a brand. It could have celebrities, it could have bloggers who you want to interact with. I did this the other day for a client. I came up with like half of One Direction. Now, for that client, I wasn't sure whether that was a good or a bad thing, frankly. <laughs> but you can find these amazing things in, in the data that you've never thought about because you don't look at every single order making its way through. Put everyone in there as a mass import to begin with. You'll find bloggers, you'll find celebrities. Frankly, you'll just find people who are influential. Then you can start following them on Twitter. Then you can make sure that you pick up their next order. If they haven't bought for a while and they're a blogger, get in touch with them and say, we've got this newer product out. Why don't I send you one for free and you write a review of it? They're very likely to say yes. They bought from you before. Presumably, they like what you've had. Even if they don't, the fact that you're offering them something different means that they'll give you a second chance. That's a powerful ally you could potentially get there. So, what I've been saying today is that more and more customers are asking for bespoke, they're asking for a service that feels personalized. So many websites aren't meeting this at the moment because they have a mentality of making the website one size fits all. We've got to break out of that mentality if we're going to keep people buying again and again and again and becoming advocates, talking about the company in a way that says, this fits in with my personal brand. If you believe in me, you should believe in this company. 
You can only start doing that if you start looking at demographic data in detail. Start really understanding not who you think buys, but who actually buys from you. What they actually care about, what their other interests are. Spend a few days deep diving into that data. It will surprise you. Once you have that, start getting the website to be responsive to that. Not just responsive to device, but responsive to their needs, their purchases. And once you've got that in place, start by default going through and identifying who is the most important part of your audience. Who are the standout people that can really start doing something for your brand and get them to start being really, really happy with you by giving them special attention. That way you'll get social mentions and you'll get links without having to do anything apart from making sure that your customers are happy because they'll talk about you on their blog, because they'll talk about you on Twitter. That way your audience is doing all the marketing at the front of the funnel, which is becoming increasingly difficult for you because you're concentrating on that great user experience. That's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for any questions? Sure. No? Okay, uh, catch, me, catch me later if you have any questions. Otherwise, tweet me, and I'll be happy to answer any that you have. Thank you.